Uh, I'm the David Goldblatt who writes about football. Um, I wrote a book in 2006 called The Ball is Round, A Global History of Football, which is a comprehensive sociological, cultural, economic, technological, sporting history of the game around the world. Uh, and that launched me on a career of writing, broadcasting and teaching about the history and sociology of football. Uh, since then I've published a book on the history of Brazilian football called Futebol Nation. Uh, and I published a book on football in England called uh, The Game of Our Lives, The Making and the Meaning of English Football. Um, sometimes I'm a visiting professor in the United States, a uh, professor of football history at Pitzer College in Los Angeles and I'm a journalist and I'm a broadcaster writing on football, politics and sport. I had wanted to write a history of the world from since I knew there was such a thing as a history of the world and with football I suddenly realised here's my way in because football is everywhere and yet at the same time football is different everywhere. So if what you're interested in is, if you like, comparative sociology, football is just truly the most extraordinary lens and um, I realised would allow me to study almost anywhere in the world. So about 2000, between 99 and 2002, um, I realised, yeah, yeah, this is the groove I'm going to be in for some time. What a good question. Which do I enjoy the most? I mean, I enjoy being a teacher more than anything, I would say. I mean, that's what just gives me the most straightforward sort of joy in my life because what's the point of knowing all this stuff if you can't share it with other people? So I find the teaching is, um, is easily the most fun. I mean, what brings me the most sort of like deep satisfaction professionally is writing. I mean, nothing compares to writing because it's the hardest thing of all to do. And because with writing, you really have to put yourself on the line. You know, with writing, there's nowhere to escape. You can't say, oh, but I meant, it's like, there it is. And I find that both scary, but also incredibly satisfactory. Eduardo Galeano, I would say, the Uruguayan writer um, and novelist who wrote Football in Sun and Shadow. And in England for many years football was not a subject that academics or intellectuals, you know, would bother to engage themselves with. Whereas, of course, in Latin America, in Brazil, in Argentina, in Uruguay, for a hundred years, the very best writers and intellectuals, of course, have been engaged with football. And so Galeano, for me, was like, on the one hand, a total hero, in that he, uh, he showed the way for me and what was possible, and also a great challenge, because, um, while Football in Sun and Shadow is a great book, there's no way it's the history of football. So it was kind of like a gauntlet being thrown down. It's like, okay, Galliano, you've set the standard and agenda. Now let's see if I can match it. Oh, that's an interesting question. I mean, biographies in football are amongst the worst books in the world. Uh, I mean, I generally don't read football as biographies because they are inauthentic, cliched, and they never tell you the stuff actually you really want to know. And that's not just about, I don't mean uh, in terms of scandal, I mean in terms of emotion. You know, actually, because actually to express the emotions of a life in football is actually really difficult. And the calibre and the quality of the writing, I think, is actually not very good. So I'm slightly like, do I really want to buy a, write a biography of anyone? Um, I'll tell you who I really love writing about is Zidane. I mean, if I had to pick one player who, for me, like just personally captures what I love about football but who I also think is an interesting if enigmatic character I would um, I would love to spend a day with Zidane there's not enough politics in football on the contrary you know, the whole, the illusion under which the football industry has operated for the last hundred years is that somehow sport and politics do not mix. So, let me just say now, this is not true, 
right? The people who have said for the last hundred years that sport and politics do not mix, what they really mean is your politics don't mix, but mine are okay because I come from a position of unreflective privilege, right? So my stuff isn't political. Let me give you an example of this, you know. The Olympics, the classic example of sport and politics don't mix. But what actually is the Olympics originally all about? You know, for Baron de Coubertin, right, who sets the thing up, he says, well, the Olympics are a display of manly virtue for which the uh, reward is the polite applause of women. And so you're going, ah, so you think sport is a way in which of expressing masculine aristocratic dominance over the world. That's not political, but other people who want to say, hey, how about women and people of colour and the disabled being part of sport, they're political. You know, it is the worst and most appalling form of hypocrisy from the powerful and the privileged, designed to make sure that the marginal and excluded don't speak. And I would say we need more of that. I mean, you know, look at the nature of the global football industry. You know, where are fans in that? Who's, who is representing their interests? The people who actually make football happen, without which it's all just the ball in the back of the net. How come we don't have a say? Where's our power in this? You know, where's the politics of that? There really is a surge in women's participation and interest in football globally. I just think that's sociological fact. I mean, if you look at the number of women actually playing the game at a grassroots level, I mean, in England, for example, the fastest growing uh, sport is women's football, particularly amongst young women. Um, and, you know, we now have professional leagues in many places around the world. We have a level of television coverage for the Women's World Cup and the European Championships and its equivalent. Um, and, you know, just walk into a football stadium these days. I mean, I'm not saying that they're... Um, you know, it ain't 50-50, but it's clearly shifted. You know, I mean, in Britain, from maybe 5-7% of the audience being female to, if you go to a club like Crystal Palace or Leicester, at least a quarter of the crowd. Or, even more amazingly, I went to see the Portland Timbers in um, the United States. 40% of the crowd are women. I mean, I've never been to a men's professional game that's 40% of the crowd. And what I think is going on here, you know, when you study the history of football, you find when a group of people who've not been a played football before suddenly get the chance to, you get football fever. People go mad for it, right? I mean, and this happened amongst young boys in Spain at the turn of the 20th century. It's happening amongst the English working classes in the 1880s. I think it's the real thing and we've only just begun. I mean, I actually think, you know, let's have this conversation in another decade and I think, you know, no one will be going, why are we bothering with women's football? It'll be like, God, how did we spend so long ignoring it? You know, it's the future. Well, that's a good question. I mean, generally football is badly managed, is what I would say. I mean, obviously there are clubs and football associations that are well managed. Um, it's not 100%, but... You know, looking at it in a global rather than a European perspective, you know, football is riddled with malpractice and corruption. I mean, right at the moment we have, you know, senior executives from CONMEBOL and from the leading Latin American football associations as well as senior executives from Tornio e Competencias and Fox America who are all on trial in New York for, you know, a wide variety of forms of bribery concerned with TV rights and so on. And as we know, that is just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, I I would be here all day if I went through how bad football management, particularly at the level of football associations, is. So, I don't know, I mean, a football seriously needs some other models from other places. Is sport the place to go? I mean, you know, there's a lot of very badly managed other sports as well, which are also full of terrible forms of corruption. I mean, you know, volleyball. Um, you know, is notorious in this regard. Global cricket is riddled with match fixing, you know, so where does one go for an alternative? I mean, I think one has to look to the best of what there is in football, actually, rather than going outside of it, as far as I can see. Um, because, you know, 
German clubs are very well managed. The German Football Association, although, you know, we know that its involvement in getting the 2006 World Cup was bending the rules beyond bending. But broadly, it's a pretty well-run club. It's a pretty well-run FA. Clubs are not in debt. There's proper licensing. Um, I think there's something to be learnt there rather than going um, to other sports, which to me are not offering much of an example to us.